we're going to continue with um, our morning session, and I'll try to get you as out of here as soon as possible so you can uh, rest, because um, the afternoon session is also kind of very heavy. Um, I was uh, talking with uh, the uh, one of the groups um, about uh, communication and applied communication, and um, I just wanted to um, tell you that uh, maybe most of the tr my training and most of the expertise that you should acquire when you're dealing with hospice and palliative um, care patients, it's uh, communication skills. Communication skills are very useful for um, palliative care, not only when dealing with patients and families, but also when you're negotiating with your institution. Um, so <laughs> I uh, invite you just to um, think about this for a second. This is a uh, presentation which is called End of Life Communication from Interdisciplinary Perspectives. Um, and we're learning to care for the lead body. And we're going to learn what the lead body means. Um, we're going to present an overview of several innovative educational methods, especially um, in communication. We're going to acknowledge the importance of interdisciplinary team approach. And we're going to talk just a little bit about communication and technology, which is one of the questions that you had in your survey. Um, I'm going to talk about general definitions, what palliative care is, what end-of-life care is, what interdisciplinary care is, and what lived body is. Um, and I think we, were, um, we went over this in uh, the group that I was uh, talking to this morning a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll talk together. Feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, if you have any questions. We're going to talk about me, we're going to talk about palliative care and end of life care. So I'm going to give you a patient now. A patient um, is Mr. Jones, and Mr. Jones <coughs> was diagnosed with lung cancer, and Mr. Jones decided to undergo surgery and coadjuvant chemotherapy. And so Mr. Jones goes here and goes to his oncologist and receives chemotherapy. And then chemotherapy is not working so well. Metastasis develops so that he receives radiotherapy. And radiotherapy is not working so well. And then the oncologist said, Mr. Jones, there is nothing else I can do for you. Thank you very much for coming. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. And so um, then he calls the hospice doctor and the hospice team. And Mr. Jones is referred to hospice care in the inpatient setting or at home. And 15 days later, Mr. Jones dies. What do you think about that? Is that real? Yeah. Is that what happened? Yeah. <laughs> you bet. Well, this is another model that I want you to think about. Mr. Jones is diagnosed with lung cancer here. And Mr. Jones has decided to go on curative therapy with surgery and, chemo and coadjuvant chemotherapy. But at the same time, a palliative care consultation is called. Now, here, Mr. Jones is not terminally ill at that point, and Mr. Jones, <coughs> excuse me, and Mr. Jones um, is having symptoms, and that's why the consult was called. So Mr. Jones, our elderly gentleman, gets curative therapy and starts getting chemotherapy. At the same time, he's getting palliative care services and interdisciplinary team approach. As the time goes by and Mr. Jones' options become less and less available for cure, palliative care becomes more and more. And it comes a point in which the hospice Medicare benefit or benefit which pay by any insurance, including the VA, is provided, and then Mr. Jones passes away. Now, compare these two models. What do you think is better? This better or the other one? This one. Why? <laughs> Why is this model better? It's not so much as treatment. Right, it's not so last minute. He was able to receive treatment, but at the same time, he was able to control his symptoms and to have an interdisciplinary team approach. And the most important thing, the patient was never abandoned. So he always felt continuity of care throughout his illness, which may last months to years. And eventually, he was referred at the appropriate moment to hospice. So in a way, what I want you to take from this is that we have modern medicine, and we have end-of-life care. But above all, we have palliative care. This is a bigger umbrella. So it's a bigger umbrella that, uh, you are right, many of our palliative care patients happen to be here. Many of them are here in the end of life. But we also could provide care for patients that are still receiving curative treatments. We cannot act as a consultant. We are specialists. We're experts. And that's very important. 
Is that clear? Now we're going to talk about interdisciplinary. So interdisciplinary in um, a general palliative care hospice team consists of a medical director, which is a physician. The, um, the patient physician should be included if the, um, if the hospice physician or the palliative care physician is not the primary physician. A nurse, social worker, pastoral care, and certified nurse assistant. And then there are other specialties uh, which you represented here today. I mean, we have a nutritionist, uh, we also have psychologists, uh, we have physician assistants, and so forth. But the idea is that the care is given by a team. It's very important that this care is provided by the teams because we can engage the patient and the family at a different stage. And, um, also, because this is different disciplines, we provide different types of expertise and we complement each other. Also for self-care, this is very important. The patients live by. So this is a term that is being out there in the literature and it's a communication about the psychological and social aspects of dying. It includes good healthcare professional and patient communication. And, um, it, it, takes us, um, it takes us team members to address issues such as depression, for example. Um, of course, it has to be very good communication again among our staff. So where are we in terms of end-of-life communication? Do you think we teach this stuff? It's funny because um, about three months ago, I, um, I um, had a course for 40 medical students in geriatric palliative care, and the first session was about communication and skills. And I asked them, what do you learn communication? What do you think communication skills are? And one of them told me, but it's what your mama told you. And I said, well, do you need to learn this in a school? Absolutely not. I know exactly how to communicate. Um, well. So I said to them, well, how do you communicate with your nurses, with the nurses that work with you? I said, well, I give them orders and they obey. Oh. And, they <laughs> and I said, so you don't need to learn any more about communication? And he said, absolutely not. He's a fourth year. He's graduating actually next week. So um, God bless us all. <laughs> so the goals of education, um, uh, the idea is to increase knowledge and expertise. Uh, the idea is to increase communication skills and to make sure that all our learners know that interdisciplinary teams are very important. We're going to talk about... We're going to talk about increasing knowledge and expertise. This is what we know about medical students. I'll tell you about medical school and I'll tell you about nursing school. I do not have data on other disciplines, sorry. But this is what we know. 74% of residents in the United States offer no training in end-of-life care. No training. That's why you see all those um, obnoxious doctors out there in the acute care setting <laughs> and in the ambulatory setting because they have no idea what they're talking about. When they're dealing with end-of-life patients, they hide away. 83% of residents, it means internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, any residency, offer no hospice rotation. None. 41% of medical students, this, listen to this, never witness an attending talking with a dying patient of his family. So actually, they've never seen this. And what is the sure thing that all doctors are going to see? Diagnosis, right. 35% um, of them never discuss the care of a dying patient with an attending physician. Isn't this terrible? Things are changing slowly, <laughs> but they are changing. They, um, this is what the medical school, um, uh, the LCME, LCME regulates medical, school, uh, medical school's curriculum. And um, in 2000, they came up with this statement. Clinical instruction must include important aspects of end-of-life care. That's it. That's all it, that it out there. I mean, something is good, but we don't really know exactly how much. ACGME, um, which is a um, institution that regulates residency, said that um, each resident should receive instruction in the principles of palliative care. It is desirable that patients participate in hospice and home care. The program must evaluate residents' technical proficiency, communication, humanistic qualities, and professional attitudes and behavior. Again, it's not what the amount of the rotation, it's not, it is crucial, it's, it's, it's what they say, it's um, desirable. But it's something, I'll take it. <laughs> um, 
in um, the annual medical school exit questionnaire, which is done to all medical schools throughout the country um, in 2002-2003, they evaluated 126 medical schools, and um, 87 of those required um, hours in palliative care. Um, they were variable. They were from four hours to 14 hours, and they could have been in lectures. Um, so we don't really know, but this is what we know we have so far. I can tell you in my medical school, we have um, two lectures at the medical school in San Antonio. We have two lectures in the first year uh, to talk about end of life care, that two hours. And then there, there are two, excuse me, there are two electives in palliative care in the fourth year, uh, which is only available for 25 medical students. I'm the director of both electives. Um, and that's it. So that's all they get. And we have 220 medical students per year. Let's talk about nursing. You're laughing about medical school. Let's, let's see what they say in this. <coughs> 3% of nursing programs in the United States have a course in end of life issues. 3%. How many nurses have dealt with a dying patient? Everybody. I hope. 40% um, of focus groups that were done in the different studies felt that there is a need to increase this content in their curriculum. So obviously the nurses know, you know, they've seen the patient, they've seen the family, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the expertise, you must do something. The, the textbooks in nursing, um, uh, in general, sh uh, show no end of life care in um, their uh, core curriculum. And um, nurses in general have reported that they wish they had learned more about caring for the dying while um, they were in the only graduate and graduate school. And Denise can probably tell you more about that. <laughs> so there are some special initiatives. Um, there is something called the OSCE, Objective and Structured Clinical Examination with Standardized Patients. And it's something um, actually that we have very cool in San Antonio. And there is a center who we actually hire actors and actresses to act as standardized patients. And uh, we take a bunch of students to their center and they act as if they were in an office and they were delivering bad news or they were doing whatever. And then they go from station to a station. So, you know, if they need to prescribe pain medicine, we evaluate them in the next station with another actor and so forth. Of course, this is costly, it's very innovative, and um, it has to come from your medical school. Um, these OSCEs are standardized throughout the country for other things, such as learning about patient education, educating patients on, uh, for example, diabetes, on smoking cessation, and so forth. So this is something that we need to use in palliative care. And we've used it um, on the, this, this past um, spring time, and it was very, very useful for our medical students. Um, some of you are aware of the ELNIC, the end of life nursing education um, uh, is consumption, I'm sorry, not curriculum. Um, this is a course that was um, initially produced by the American Cancer Society, and then it, it kind of got um, expanded to all diagnoses, and it's a certification for nurses. It's a two-day intensive training um, in end of life issues. Um, it's something that we have discussed to bring here. We have a trainer, Bonnie, Bonnie Hauer is in San Antonio, and she will probably, we will probably be discussing this with uh, the vision director to be bringing that educational program to all our, our nurses uh, here at Temple. And then it's the same initiative for physicians. So the education on palliative uh, end of life care. And um, this is again a two day intensive program um, for physicians and we could actually think about bringing it. This is mainly for physicians who are not certified or not practicing palliative care. This is kind of a very simple curriculum. Um, and they, it, it kind of goes over um, what is advanced directives, what is pain, how do you deal with pain, how do you deal with the last hours of care, and so forth. And then there is uh, this very, very interesting uh, thing, which is specifically for oncologists. Um, it was designed for oncologists, because oncologists are well known out there um, for being uh, not too sensitive to end of life care patients. Um, and so they decide one specifically for oncologists, and uh, it's very, very interesting. And then there is a, a PSEP, which is a Harvard program, and it stands for Palliative Care Education and Practice. And this is more for uh, practitioners like you who are dealing with uh, terminally ill patients and with palliative care patients in a regular basis. Um, and it's, it's actually very expensive, but they do have scholarships. So if you're interested, you can check it out on the Harvard website. And it's a two-week course. I took it about two years ago, and they have it, um, it's one week in the spring and one week in the fall. 
and they give you a lot of things. They give you symptom management, communication skills, and a lot of networking and mentorship. So it's very good for the program's leaders or somebody who's thinking about expanding a palliative care program. So it's maybe something that you want to think about doing. Um, I attended with interdisciplinary team members, so nurses, social workers, uh, uh, doctors, everybody was there. And it's, it's somewhat competitive if you need funding, um, but it's very, very uh, good, and it's in Boston. And then there is the CAPSI, our Center for Advanced Palliative Care. And this uh, is an initiative from um, uh, Dr. Diane Meyer, who is one of the pioneers of palliative care, one of my mentors, and she is, uh, uh, she has uh, created this center for advanced palliative care and what they do is they have specific sites throughout the country to train teams. So they want a team of physicians, nurses, social workers, everybody that wants to come, including hopefully a financial officer uh, to make this program viable, if you will. And they take people for a three-day training and they show them the program and they have different models. If you have a nursing home model, they take you. If you have a consultation model, they take you. If you have an overall model, they take you to different places in the country. Um, again, it's a little bit expensive, so it would have to be funded by your institution, but they also have some funding available. Um, and this is all on the website. If you, if you click on capsi.org, they'll be able, you'll be able to find it. It's very easy. Um, I'm going to compare now um, what geriatrics and palliative care means, um, because I think that, and I think there's a handout that you will receive regarding this, but um, there is a um, difference between geriatrics and palliative care. Um, I want you to be very careful about saying that palliative care is the same than geriatrics. Um, first of all, geriatricians do not like it. Uh, and second, um, it's not the same. So we're going to compare the differences. The population in geriatrics is older. And in palliative care, of course, we have many older adults because older adults die. And older adults get sick and older adults get symptoms. However, we do have some younger adults here in palliative care. Quality of life is very important in both um, specialties. Geriatric syndromes, in geriatrics we deal with, as you know, with falls, with mental status changes, with pain, with weakness. And in palliative care it's more about symptoms to make them comfortable. Family involvement is actually absolutely very important in both specialties uh, because you cannot do a good discharge planning if you don't have family around. There are both some specialties, but what I want you to remember is that geriatrics the functional status is very, very important. And in palliative care, we're more focused on comfort and quality of life. So if functional status has to do with comfort and quality of life, then that's palliative care. But if it's only about functional status here, yeah, it's geriatrics. Is that clear? <coughs> I was trying to um, put this into a chart there, but I wasn't very successful, I'm sorry. Um, anyway. <laughs> This is what we have down there in San Antonio. And um, this is our geriatric palliative care program. We have a palliative care fellowship. Um, I was telling um, half of this group that it's very important that you have a clinical component, an educational component, and a research component. The reason for that is because clinical component, obviously, you need to serve your veterans. Educational component, you need innovative stuff. And you also need learners to um, challenge you and to help you with the clinical services and you need your medical school but also research because you need money and you need data so remember that we have the fellowship program in San Antonio which is an interprofessional fellowship we have physicians we have nurses psychologists chaplains and social workers they're all trainees and this is completely funded by the VA and then we have our consultation service uh, which we actually go all over the hospital and it's a venue to um, be used for education. We, we educate many, many um, other non-palliative care practitioners about palliative care. We have an inpatient hospice unit, like you. We have community home hospice services, uh, which at any given time we may have 50 to 60 patients enrolled in it. We have clinics, uh, we have an outpatient palliative care clinic, and then we have pediatric palliative care, which is mainly educational. Obviously, we don't refer any veterans to this program. But um, it's, a, um, it's just a uh, educational program for ourselves. Any questions about that? So, um, okay. This is what we need to have in our pediatric palliative care team. 
patient and family, um, we put them in the middle. They are the most important thing for us. We have nurses, we have physicians, we have interdisciplinary trainees. So if you have, um, I'm not sure if you have nursing students here or other trainees, but if you do, they are very important part of the team and you must accept them and embrace them. Um, we have research staff, um, which we have gotten with research money to collect data for us. We have social work, we have chaplains, we have psychologists, and then we have communication experts um, that are helping us to improve our communication and to research in communication. Now we're going to talk about communication skills. So I'm going to play a little video of members of our team talking about clinical values. <coughs> For instance, we were called, uh, this was maybe about a year ago, I hadn't been here very long, we were called to a home by the wife, uh, that her husband was literally on his deathbed, she was exhausted, she didn't have really much help in the home, and could be found. And as you know, anybody can refer to hospice, anybody can make that phone call. And so I went, and uh, he had, uh, congestive heart failure, he was dysmic at rest, he had ascites, he had four plus edema, uh, he was uh, breathless talking to me, and he had some medications that he wasn't taking, the late six included, and he wasn't going to take them, he said. He was alert, he was not committed. Uh, we, we could see that he was easily in New York class four, uh, and would qualify under in stage heart. Uh, we wanted to, to bring in continuous care uh, until it was, was more stabilized. And, and as you know, uh, two physicians need to certify. Uh, so we always try to get the primary care physician to uh, serve as one of those physicians. We called him and he said, oh, absolutely not. This patient's not ready for hospice. And uh, would not agree to certify. Uh, he did come out. Uh, to see the patient, which I was impressed by a bunch of all my house calls. He came out to see the patient about two days after I was there and uh, chastised the patient for not taking the Lasix and the other medications and, and uh, maybe he gave a verbal promise he would do that uh, and left. The patient never took any of those medications. Uh, a week later, the doctor did go back could see that he wasn't any better, called us, and we came in and the patient lived three days. And we see a lot of this uh, sort of thing. There's just so many doctors out there that still don't know what hospice is about. Uh, I guess they, I, I, they probably are where I was more than six years ago, and that is I felt like hospice hastened death. Uh, I felt like uh, if you really wanted to kill somebody off, just refer them to hospice. And so a lot of doctors had to come from that point to where I am, or somewhere where I am. Uh, and that's that's our challenge, I think. Familiar? So definitely uncertainty, anxiety from the patient and the doctor, feelings of failure, expressed emotion, and lack of training, which is a big one. For instance, we were called uh, All the challenges, time is definitely a barrier. When we say about the, the, the cumulative respect and cumulative role that I think in society itself mm -hmm. post that. This is one of our things. And if you go outside the news constantly, you see the news pumping that, hey, you're the doctor, you should cure this. So it's an expected role that we have to change in the society, saying, well, unfortunately today, not all diseases are cured, could it curable? You know, not everybody would come to suffer. Okay? And I think this, the second part, what I think happened between physicians and patients, especially our diagnosis, is problem with communication. Is the skill of communicate that diagnosis. I mean, uh, I go to the gym clinic, for example, or to the autonomology clinic, and I say to somebody, what well, that what I have? And I say, well, you have a skill there? Now I'm sure she don't hear anything. She don't know what it is, you know, 
She don't know what that is, what, what is that prognosis. She don't know anything about it. She would ask any question, because now she will sound like a stupid person. Okay, so she will stop right there. And I'm sure, like that, it's very common in daily practice. Okay, you ask me a question and you give me an answer. Yeah, but what imply that answer? If the I come and say exactly, in her words, what what is going on, she might be able to understand. That means another five minutes to explain. And when you work against clock, like this analogy uh, might be, you know, it's kind of, okay, uh, this is what you have. And, uh, you know, instead of sitting down and say, well, we have tried this chemotherapy and it's not working. So, you know, the chances would be that we just switch that it might not respond at all. It's easy to say, it's not negative to fight. Next. We also have educational barriers. And one-way communication is one of the main things we encounter. And one is communication. Uh, and that's called therapeutic silence. When you say the diagnosis and you see that shocked look and you know they're not going to hear another word you say, it's okay to let that silence occur, that therapeutic silence, and offer to come back later and have another session and talk about it later. Let them get their thoughts together, let them develop some questions in their mind. Uh, so sometimes it is better to let them have that silent period so that you can reschedule another visit with them. But I know what you're saying, that doctors are stuck in such time pressure to uh, see the next one, the next one, the next one, but you don't have a lot of time. And that's sad because you just cannot deliver bad news in five minutes. Uh, you need to have a time, a time block where you do not act rushed uh, in order to deliver bad news effectively. Team barriers are something that we encounter when, um, uh, oh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're different. And uh, because it comes from different, we come from different backgrounds and different disciplines, we're going to encounter some tension. And that's why it's so important to get to know very well our team um, and to know where is everybody coming from. Um, <coughs> there are different disciplines, and uh, this is what our um, it's psychologists difficult. Have, this is our psychologists have to say. It's difficult to not be able to work with the other disciplines more because of the nature of how they work, of how busy they are, of how hard it is to to find time for kind of team building types of experiences. And kind of the misunderstandings of each other and, and how we work. I can't just drop my patients and move to another rotation. That's unethical according to my discipline's ethics code. I can't do that. And not that that means it's unethical for other disciplines to do that. They're, they're different. They work differently. Um, but it makes it more difficult to, to work together. There are potential solutions, definitely the clinical barriers, and we were discussing in our group, and it's education is kind of our hope. It's very important that we tell other providers and our team members that there is a way of knowing what palliative care is about. And um, for, team for team buyers, we must have interdisciplinary team meetings, and we must have self-care meetings, which in our program we call spiritual wraps, but um, you can call it any way you like. It's just that uh, it has to be a self-care, and we should acknowledge how important each member is, how difficult it is to care for uh, terminally and clinically ill patients, and how appreciative we are of the work of others. And educational barriers, um, we uh, need to address those through family meetings. In family meetings, I find that when I invite trainees to those, they appreciate what palliative care is about. Um, so just do that if you have trainees around you. Family meetings provide a team environment. It includes patient and family, and it's based on communication. When you deliver bad news, when you are um, getting a plan of care together, when you are addressing the spiritual issues uh, about the patient and family, when you are addressing end of life care. Family meetings are essential uh, to treating the patient's sleep body. Um, it's well documented the need and the uh, importance of involving patient and family in the plan of care. 
Uh, we do know that family meetings improve satisfaction with care, coordination with care, and communication. Um, because family members do want to know. They want to honor their loved one's wishes. They want to be included. They want to have a specific support assistance. They want practical help. They want personal care needs. Um, they want information. They want access to care. They want to be listened to. And um, inclusion in the decision process is the biggest thing. But there are challenges to family meetings. Um, and there's a difficulty in listening. When we do family meetings, I don't know if you know this, but physicians wait eight seconds before they interrupt a, a patient going to their to their office. Eight seconds. Um, so what how can I help you? And they start, well I have this pay paywear. And so that's the main thing. <laughs> and that's terrible. Um, so we need to listen. Um, this is our one of our fellows' perspective. The least understandable person would be the patient itself because of the dementia. We hold no one but several meetings. And every time we come to the meeting, it's like we are exactly in the same stage. It's like nobody, out of they didn't want to know what's going on. It was really frustrating for them going through that. But it's like every time we explain, do you know what's going on with the patient, they come with total different uh, story about what their perception is and what, what's going on. And at the end of the meeting, they are able to explain you back what's going on with the patients, and the patient is dying. And we're going to think about it, but a hospice and all that. We're going to get back to you. And the next meeting is, it's like that never took place, never happened. And finally, after three or four minutes, the family decided that they don't want any hospice, that they want to handle it on their own. There's also a difficulty making decisions, and this is from our system. Because it's so hard when you don't know what the patient wants, and that's the part that really is hard for me. When you see the family members struggling, and oh, I don't know, I don't know, I know, I know what I would want, but I don't know what he would want, and so that's what's hard. And so that was one of the nice parts too. And of course, we deal with difficult family dynamics, right? Yes. We've seen this before. Been there, done that. I know. Um, so what is a framework for family meetings? Definitely we need to know what we're talking about. So we need to have a pre-meeting with the rest of the team. Not only with our team, but also with the other physicians and the other team that is kind of caring for this patient. Then um, I always say this to my team, and Denise can attend to that, but we need to bring the patient into the room. Now, do you have to bring the bed into the room? Not really. What I'm talking about is you need to bring who is this person into the room. Who is Mr. Jones? Was he a baseball player? Was he a father and a loving husband? Was he a gentleman who um, may have had problems with his family? Who was this person? Is the only way that the family is going to relate to the patient is to remember who he was. Otherwise, we're going to lose perspective. And Mrs. Jones is going to talk about what she wants, and Mr. Jones Jr. is going to talk about what he wants, and the other 11 children are going to talk what they want, but they're not going to talk about what Mr. Jones, the patient, wants. We must bring the patient into the room. And then we use the SPIKES model. And I don't know if you're familiar with the SPIKES model. Are you familiar with the SPIKES model? So the SPIKES model is a model of delivering bad news. And S stands for setting, so you need to get an adequate environment. <coughs> P um, stands for um, permission to deliver the bad news. I stands for introduction. K stands for knowledge. E stands, stands for empathizing, and S stands for um, strategy. So you, do a, you, you set up a good background, you ask for permission, you introduce the topic, you uh, deliver your knowledge in the more, in the most simple way, you empathize with your patient, and you leave them with them. Again, this is the SPICE model. So S stands for setting. P stands for permission and perception. I'm sorry, perception. I, I say this wrong. Perception. P stands for I stands for indication. K stands for knowledge. E stands for empathy. And S stands for strategy. And I can send this to you. I think it's in, oh, it's not in your packet, but I can send this to you. So once we do the spice model, we need to comfort and we need to reframe. We need to again go over the things that we set in our family meeting. And we're talking about family meetings because those, the, the family meetings are the main model for communication. We're not going to do role play right now because we're very tired. Um, family meetings, again, is a good 
skill to master it, but um, there are different rewards to learning about communication. And there is an understanding of the family. And this is what uh, one of our nurses had to say. There was one case with the patient in the ICU where he had just everything. And we met with the family. And the family said, as they were talking about what the patient wanted, they had the awareness of what they had done. And, Which was totally nice. Yeah, and it was all the things he hadn't wanted. But they had done them well intended. But to see their awareness of what they had done and how it wasn't what he wanted. And you know how you have those ahas? Mm -hmm. The family had their aha in and, and the family meeting. And then your role switches in that moment. How so? Your overall goal is to journey with the family and the patient for the patient's best outcome, respecting the family where they have the ability. And our role went from basically bringing knowledge and options to comforting the family and saying, that's okay. You did the best you could. And letting them know that being human is okay. When we went in at the beginning, it was, okay, here are the options. How can we help you with it? And then all of a sudden it switched into caring for the family, which it, which it typically does. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I, I think in the family meetings, you're caring for the family. But your focus changes. And um, it's about understanding the well into a family meeting. It's about facilitating difficult conversations. It was a good reminder to me of how good it can be and how important it is when you do the advanced directives with people, um, when you do their living well and they do appoint someone to be their durable power of attorney for health care to reinforce, please have these conversations with people. And it made me more conscious about encouraging, well, why don't, you know, when is your daughter coming into the hospital? We'll just pay, I'll give you my patient number and you can patient me and the three of us can sit down and we'll have a conversation together with patients that are not comfortable talking with their family members or saying, well, you know, my daughter doesn't, I try to have this conversation, but my daughter doesn't want to hear it or my wife doesn't want to hear it and being a little more aggressive about encouraging them to, to let me facilitate that with them mm -hmm. instead of just relying on it. Instead of just encouraging them to do it, take that extra step to really try to get in there and say, well, no, let's sit down and do this now way, way in the beginning of the disease process, or even when they're still relatively healthy. Which is what we need to do. We must educate everybody so they can do this and talk about the communication skills and talk about end-of-life care before they get into end-of-life care. And of course, we need to understand the context. Um, the reason I'm putting all these videos and clips and um, audio clips here is because our team in Ghana wanted to be present here with you. I wish I can, brought, you know, I can, I can bring them all and just kind of share what, what this team building is about. And, um, but it's very important if you see they have different perspectives and we all kind of respect each other, which is wonderful. Um, this is our part of our team, not all the members are here, but we have learners, we have chaplains, we have nurses, we have everybody. And, um, and so uh, we have physicians, we have you know, a lot of people that make this possible. And um, you, I, I can see you here, you have the same. Um, and we're all kind of working with the same mission, which is wonderful. Um, so in disciplinary care, um, I don't have to tell you this, but of course you know that this improves the healthcare process, it benefits the healthcare system and caregivers, adequately prepares healthcare providers for better care of older adults and terminally ill patients. Um, the, um, it's important to know that it has to be interdependence. So because you're a nurse or because you're a physician, you shouldn't say, well, I'm the team leader and this is what we're going to do and that's the end of it. No. The idea is that you depend on, on your team member, you're an equal, um, and you're flexible. And um, there are different boundaries that have to be respected and there are flexibility that have to be respected. Um, of course, there are activities that um, sometimes we don't really know what the nurse does or what the social worker does, so that education is very important. Um, we need to um, have collective ownership of the goals. So yes, we are a social worker, and yes, we are nurses, and yes, we are physicians, and yes, we are what chaplains, but our main goal is to care for a patient, and that plan is developed by all of us, not only by one person. So we all have to take ownerships in the good cases and in the bad cases. 
and it has to be a reflective process. Um, so obviously we need to have a team evaluation of team's out outcomes, which I think you're doing already. So um, team member collaboration provides for holistic care of the patient's live body, and um, our chaplain actually summarized it very nicely. If there's conflict, the chaplain can come in and help maybe address the conflict, can give help solicit trust toward the medical team, toward the doctor. Because a lot of times we can clarify. There's one time I was talking with a patient and a doctor came in and gave him an explanation that they couldn't do any more chemo on him. And uh, the patient didn't hear it, just, just didn't hear it. So I was able to say it because I was the chaplain. I said pretty much the same thing as the doctor said. But I think because I was the chaplain and I was just a normal person, he he could he could hear me, and he he didn't hear the doctor. And I don't think the doctor appreciated in that particular instant what I did, but I know the patient did. And um, one of the big examples of interdisciplinary team approach to treatment of pain, and I always tell my fellows that. Um, there are four different types of pain. <coughs> the physical pain is the one that we treat with morphine, and that's the easiest way, the easiest one to treat. You just read the table, order the morphine, and it's gone, hopefully. Or you increase the morphine, or you change the morphine, it's not a big deal. That we can do. Um, the problem is that, uh, I don't know if you encountered this, but I have many times, is if they have a spiritual pain, emotional pain, or psychological pain, I'm not able to control the physical and I do not have the expertise to address the spiritual pain, emotional pain, or psychological pain. So I need my team, I need the chaplain to be able to explore their spiritual pain. Is there something, a conflict with religion that they had before? Do they want to come back to their denomination? Is there a problem with, uh, with their um, spirituality? Um, emotional pain, um, are they going to feel, are they feeling lonely because of this disease? Um, psychological pain, psychosocial pain, um, we should say there. Um, if I die, is my widow going to be taken care of because they're, gonna have, they're not going to have my pension anymore? So those are things that I'm not able to address if I didn't have a team. That's kind of one of the best examples. Um, you cannot treat physical pain if you don't treat the other pain. Um, something else to consider in the future, and I think Dr. Sanders was talking a little bit about it, was communication technology and interdisciplinary teams to be able to connect the patient via internet or via video and to be able to connect the family and to be able to connect all the teams and to, uh, for us to network from you know, Temple San Antonio or Temple New York, who knows what. Um, we must um, have technology and, and we're getting there. Um, it's a way to go, but we're getting there. It is something that we sometimes use um, to facilitate communication between patients and, and team members. So I'm going to end up here because um, we have had a very busy morning. It's about 15 minutes to uh, the hour, and you have uh, about an hour for lunch. So we'll gather here at 1 p.m. Um, if we can be on time, that would be really appreciated because uh, we have a lot to do this afternoon. We thank you very much for being here. We enjoy this very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, are there any questions?